Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Book 11 of his City of God, Augustine considers a question about creation and evil. If God created everything and saw that it was good, then why do we encounter evil within the world? And this is indeed a, a deep and pressing question. He notes that it constitutes a problem for many people and that there's multiple solutions to it, not all of which he thinks are actually correct, a few of which we'll, we'll look at at the end of this. So if God creates everything, why are there things that are wrong, things that are evil? This requires us to think a bit about well, what do we actually mean by evil when we use that word or badness. You can, you, you know, malum could be translated either way. Um, there's many different ways of understanding what's evil. And at one extreme, we might conceive of what we call moral evil. So the person who sits down and deliberately hurts another being, you know, the kid who's pulling the wings off of a fly and laughing while he's doing so, or the adult who cheats and lies and, and takes pleasure in doing that. Or if you want to use a theological context, you might think of the devil and the fallen angels, you know, tempting other human beings, trying to get them to participate in their own corruption. With that, we can talk about the will, the human free will, or the, the will of other rational creatures, as being responsible for that introduction of evil into the world. And to some degree, that gets God off the hook. There are some problems that can come up with that later. Well, why did God create wills that could, could fall or turn away or do the wrong thing? But we're going to put that aside for the moment. That's, that's a very interesting question, but it's not so germane to this, this other type of evil that is traditionally distinguished, which is what we call natural evil. And natural evil has less to do with somebody saying, I want to do the wrong thing, or I'm going to do what I think is the right thing, which actually turns out to be the wrong thing. Like, I'm going to follow my sexual desire or my desire for, for drinking or my desire for revenge, and then I do something bad. There's a whole natural world that's filled with things that we perceive as bad, that we don't like. I mean, just take... Uh, we, we've got some examples that we can look at with Augustine. But just think about a camping trip, right? You go camping and you forget some of your supplies. So you forgot bug spray. And now you've got mosquitoes buzzing around your head. And if, you're, you, know, if you know much about mosquitoes firsthand, you know it, it, it's not any fun. They buzz in your ears and then they, they you know, bite you and they stick their proboscis into you and suck your blood out. And then afterwards it itches and you have to take care of it. And then here come some more mosquitoes, right? Why did God make mosquitoes? Why not have a, a universe where there's none of these stinging things? Or you might get, after the mosquitoes get you, then you find a couple ticks on you. And you're worried about, oh, am I going to get a disease? You know, maybe I'll get limes. Uh, and then, you, you know, depending on where you are here in, in Wisconsin, you could get what we call chiggers, which are these things that burrow into your flesh and itch terribly. And you're not supposed to scratch it, right? That's just an example. And then think about the other things that can happen while you're camping. You know, you spend the day outside and you get sunburned and your skin is peeling and blistering. And, oh, this is awful, you know. Or uh, you bring your food and the 
Raccoons steal it. Now you're hungry. <laughs> your stomach is, is growling and you're like, oh, I wish I'd brought some more food or I wish I'd hid it up in the, the trees like they told me to do. Um, and then, a, you know, maybe a bear comes and tears down your tent and chases you away. And we could go on and on and on and on and on, right? He uses the examples, which are good, perfectly fine examples of fire. Fire has, you know, done a lot of damage, just think about all the damage that happened this year with the California wildfires. Won't be the last year, by the way. Uh, frost, you know, people lose their fingers, their toes, their noses. Sometimes they completely die. Frost comes along and kills your beautiful flowers that you put out. Or when you put your seedlings out uh, that you've planted or you've, you know, just planted the, the seeds in the field and you've got some good crops going, long comes the frost and kills them all, right? And it even makes the things look disgusting afterwards, the frost burn. Um, wild beasts, I mentioned bears chasing you. If you get caught by a bear, um, you're probably going to have a lot of trouble. You know, they've got advice for you, but there's nothing that says the advice is actually gonna work. And there's all sorts of other kinds of wild beasts even our own tame beast. There was a guy who died from his dog licking him and giving him a disease. A otherwise seemingly fairly healthy man. So there's all these sorts of things. Then we can add in natural disasters. We can add in, you know, various weather things that don't kill us but inconvenience us. You know, you're walking to school and you've got your, your paper printed out and here comes a, a downpour and now your paper's completely soaked because you didn't put it in a briefcase or something like that. And we can go on and on and on, right? So... Augustine says, yeah, these, these are experienced as evil. Why? Because they injure or destroy our frail flesh. And we could go further and say they not only destroy and injure or inconvenience our frail flesh, they also mess around with all the other stuff that we like. All of our tools like books, clothing, you know, recording devices. They, they screw all these things up. So, Augustine isn't saying that the universe doesn't contain all these sorts of processes, things that vex us, sometimes kill us, make us hurt. But he says they're good in themselves. They're bad for us in a certain way, but they are good in themselves. And he tells us a number of different ways in which this occurs. And he says, this is what we could look at. This is what we could consider. He says, we could consider how admirable these things are in their own places, how excellent in their own nature. So let's pause on that and just take a few examples. Think about fire. Fire is incredible. Without it, the human race could not have advanced. And it's beautiful to watch. It's also, you know, kind of scary if you're caught in a fire and it burns the hell out of you if, you, if you're not careful. But fire is pretty impressive, isn't it? Wild beasts are pretty cool too. That's why people like watching nature shows or going to zoos. There's something incredibly impressive about watching a bear or a giraffe or a wolf or even, I don't know what, what you're into, but I, I like watching spiders. I think they're, they're fascinating creatures. So in themselves, there's something admirable about, admirable about that. And he says, how beautifully adjusted to the rest of creation and how much grace they contribute to the universe by their own contributions as to a commonwealth. Let's take the mosquito again, right? We could say, let's kill all, the, all those damn mosquitoes. Well, if we do that, there's a lot of other animals that are going to suffer that live on those mosquitoes. And there is a, a point to them within this great chain uh, that we call the ecosystem. And, and Augustine has a conception of that there. He doesn't think that the whole purpose of mosquitoes being put on earth is just to suck blood out of us and make us angry and crazy and upset and, you know, raise welts on us. There's, there's other points to it. They're part of a commonwealth, a framework that the divine established. So they are good in themselves in a certain way. It's when things go, go wrong with them, he says. They are serviceable even to ourselves if we use them with a knowledge of their fit 
adaptation. So it's not just that they're good in themselves or good within their, their microcosm or macrocosm. It's also they can be good for us. Now, there's not a hell of a lot we can do with mosquitoes, but think about all the other things that we have adapted animals, plants, the, the environment itself to do to, to suit us. There are so many incredible uses that we get out of things, many of them just for luxuries, but some of them for life-saving or life-enhancing purposes. So what does it take for that? We have to have knowledge and we have to use them rightly. And Augustine points out, even the things that we normally consider to be good things, we can misuse them and they can screw us up. That doesn't mean that they become bad things. And he gives you uh, examples, food, drink, the light of the sun, right? Uh, food, you need to eat it. Can you make yourself fat? Can you make yourself sick? Can you do all sorts of other things to yourself with food? Yes. Same thing with drink. Even the light of the sun, which we need in order to continue life. Either that or you got to go under a sun lamp or take some vitamin D. What happens if you take too much of it? Well, you can get skin cancer. You can uh, get sunburn. You can have all sorts of other things happen to you. So it's, it's not as if there's anything wrong with nature and the natural world and natural things as such. It's very context dependent. And Augustine is pointing out, we have some control over a good portion of that context, don't we? So he goes on and he says that, you know, we ought to carefully investigate the use of all of these things so that we can make the best use of them. He gives the example of medicine. A lot of medicines are actually poisons that we adapt in a certain respect and provide at the right time in the right measure, and then they work out good for us. So he says that, you know, if we think about the creation as such, it was in fact created good. And here's where he turns to talking about this priority of goodness over evil. Or another way we can say it is the goodness of creation is primary. We can find some what we call natural evil, but it's not even truly evil in the same sense that moral evil is. And here's where he thinks that um, a few other, at his time, major representatives of theological adaptation of, of philosophy and several other ways of doing metaphysics within a theological context are fundamentally mistaken. He targets the Manichaeans, who are a very popular uh, group at his time, a, a church that he actually belonged to. And he says that um, some people suppose that an evil nature has been generated and propagated by a kind of opposing principle proper to it, so that evil would in fact have genuine existence. It would not simply be a lack or absence or privation of the good, but rather its own sort of force personified. He says, uh, these people refuse to admit that the cause of the creation was this, that the good God produced a good creation. They think instead that he is already at war, so to speak, or engaging in a bit of, uh, you know, guerrilla warfare with this, this evil creation that's already been put. And then you've got these two forces in opposition. And Augustine says that doesn't really work for the created world. The other person that he talks about is Origen, who is a Christian theologian. Uh, and Origen went to some extremes, you could say, in some of the positions that he adopted and promulgated. And Origen had this view that, um, as Augustine is setting it out, that um, we're, we're sort of souls imprisoned within this earthly creation. So he says, um, these people say that souls are created by God, but they sin by abandoning God. And in proportion to their various sins, they merited various degrees of debasement from heaven to earth and diverse bodies as prison houses. And so this world is itself a prison house. And he says, well, that doesn't really work. And here's one argument why. It, it seems like if that's the case, the worse you are, the more corporeal you ought to be, the more base you ought to be. 
And we don't even see that with human beings. But I mean, think about the case of the devil and the fallen angels. They then shouldn't have, you know, ethereal bodies or existences. They should be as gross and corporeal as possible. But that doesn't really make sense. And, and he thinks that these are mistaken conceptions of creation that would say that creation is naturally evil. Or at least the, the world that we have is naturally evil, and then God somehow makes some good out of it, intrudes some good. Augustine is saying, no, everything is good. There is also moral evil caused by wills. There is what we perceive as natural evil, which is badness, but it's not badness in itself. It's just poorly adapted goodness of some sort or an absence of the goodness that ought to be there. So this is a very important discussion in, in Book 11. Uh, it connects up with many other discussions along the same lines that Augustine has. And it represents, as I pointed out, uh, an attempt to bring a metaphysical principle and perspective within a larger Christian theological framework.